Over at bangthebook.com, I've already taken a college football first look with my Week 7 power ratings and also the Week 7 opening line report. A lot of interesting lines out there, interesting line movements as well. Talked about some of those over at the website and did the same thing for Week 6 in the NFL where we've got what looks to be a pretty competitive week here coming up. Also over there, we've got a new tennis preview from Big Ten Watto for the Shanghai Masters. We've got Alan Moody's MLB picks for today's four playoff games. Parker Michaels' daily NHL piece, always a must read. Definitely want to make sure that you're checking that out. And throughout the week, we'll have UFC, soccer, additional baseball coverage as I write some more series previews for the ALCS and the NLCS, a golf preview from James Mazzola, more NFL and college football content. Be a very busy week over at bangthebook.com. Finally, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest on the program here today, we'll have him for the full hour. That is professional handicapper Kyle Hunter of huntersportspicks.com. Kyle, how's it going today, man? I'm doing all right. You know, um, licking my wounds from a bad weekend in college football this past weekend. I'd, I'd had three or four really good weekends in a row in college football. Certainly bound to happen. Uh, better NFL Sunday and hoping for better things ahead in college football. You certainly hate to see a really rough weekend. I will say that, you know, last week when we talked about the card coming up for uh, last week's college football, we talked about the fact that the, it really wasn't a very exciting week and it turned out to be you know, kind of that way as we expected. Uh, I do think that there are a lot more good games, both really in the NFL and college football for the week ahead. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. I mean, you know, you look at the college card and Iowa and Michigan, you know, premier game on paper wound up being kind of a snoozer. Auburn and Florida, there were a bunch of turnovers in that game, so that wasn't a very good game either. Um, You know, we did have some interesting results, certainly some surprising upsets. Stanford over Washington, of course, being the biggest one, but Yeah, overall, you know, not a lot of watchability here uh, for the college football slate in week six. And hopefully we get some better stuff here in week seven. But one thing I do want to mention that you just touched on there, you know, as you said, not a great week in college football for you. But something that I think is really challenging in the position that you're in, you know, you may have and you're a high volume guy in particular in college basketball. And that'll be a season that starts up here in less than a month. I believe it's what, four weeks from today or four weeks from tomorrow, something like that. But you wind up with a lot of games that you like, and then you have to pick and choose what you want to send out to clients because you can't send out 15 or 18 plays and expect everybody to play everything. So sometimes maybe you just pick wrong. Yeah, that's that's how it went this past weekend. You know, when you go one and six on the games that you actually play and then your leans go nine and four or whatever mine went. I, I know that, uh, you know, I, I was exactly split down the middle as far as, uh, you know, wins and losses from the initial leans, but the ones that I actually played went one and six. It's gone the other way too. Well, you know, let's be honest. It, it's obviously gone the way where, you know, I've had five and one, six and one, seven and one days where the rest of the leans didn't do well. It's hard to take when you have a bad day, when you see the rest of the leans do really well, but you know, it's part of the business and you, you move on and, and uh, you know, as long as I keep getting good closing line value, I, I would think that I will do well in the long run. One quick note here for our listeners. Obviously, we sound a little bit different. Kyle and I decided to record on Skype today. We got some positive feedback about that last week. I'm going to try to do that with more of my guests here. You know I do that uh, with the Odds Report segment on Fridays, but I'm going to try to do that with more of my guests here, uh, try and get them acclimated to recording that way. Then I'll just have to do some editing and cutting with the show. But you know, I think that just uh, the, the better sound quality is something that I want to focus on here. So I will be Trying to get my guests to do that on short notice this week. Maybe it won't happen, but in subsequent weeks here, I am hoping to do a little bit more of that. But let's go ahead and take a look at this Monday night football game here, Kyle. The Browns and the 49ers. 49ers, a five-point favorite. Oddly enough, five pretty much across the offshore market, except for four and a half at Bovada and my bookie, and five and a half at Matchbooks. So, Listen, we've got a pretty well-defined sharp versus public split here. Definitely. I I think that's really interesting. Um, You know, this line has moved a decent amount. I like the 49ers here a little bit um, at at the lower number, but now that it's up to five, it's hard to have too strong of a lean here on the side. I I feel like, 
you know, this is a pretty good spot for San Francisco, given that Cleveland is coming off that big win against Baltimore. I think it still remains to be seen exactly what Cleveland is, you know, because we were considering them or most people were considering them a pretty big disappointment before last game. And then they, they blow out the Ravens. How good are the Ravens? You know, the Ravens um, probably fairly fortunate to win that game yesterday against Pittsburgh. So, you know, I feel like that was, you know, not a great look for the Ravens. I think Cleveland's a, a quality team, not a, a great team or not a bad team. San Francisco's looked very good. And I, I think San Francisco probably has the coaching advantage here. And that, that's one of the reasons why I like San Francisco with a little bit of extra time here. You got a really good coaching staff. They seem to be playing very well. I think Cleveland will likely have a hard time stopping this San Francisco offense here. Yeah, and of course, no Denzel Ward, no Greedy Williams once again for the Browns. Both of these teams with really good pass rushes. And I'm curious to see which pass rush is able to get home more frequently in this game. We know the Browns have had offensive line issues all year long. San Francisco hasn't played too many teams that have a pass rush the caliber of Cleveland. So I do want to see what Kyle Shanahan drew up during the bye week to sort of offset the edge pressure that the Browns can get. And also, Larry Ogunjobi was very good with pressure up the middle in that game against Baltimore. But that's the thing about the NFL here that's so interesting is that, you know, Baltimore looks bad against the Browns last week, didn't look particularly good against Pittsburgh yesterday. And sort of while that game is going on, you see a little bit of a fade of Cleveland. And and we get that a lot here in the NFL where it's so reactionary that, you know, if you played well the week before against the team and that team that you just beat comes out and plays badly the next week, it almost is a negative reflection on you in the marketplace. Whether that's deserved or not, I don't know. But it is something you do pick up on every week following the NFL. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes that can be a bit overrated. You know, it's it's not... um... One doesn't always equal the other, and I think some bettors think that it does. Uh, I think in this case, you can understand why, uh, you know, Cleveland might be getting disrespected a little bit based on that because we wonder how good that win over Baltimore was. Baltimore's defense is pretty weak right now, especially that secondary. So let's see how um, Baker Mayfield looks against San Francisco. San Francisco, I would say, not that strong of a secondary, but like you said, a very good pass rush. So we'll see if uh, Mayfield can have some time here. To me, you know, another interesting point about this game is Jerome Boger's crew is the one that's uh, calling this game. There's there's a couple of things about that that's, that's notable. The home team's done very well in, in games that uh, Boger's crew has been in, and the over's done very well. The home team, 88 and 73 ATS, the over, 97 and 67. Yeah, and we got the over here, 47 and a half, up a little bit from 46 and a half midweek. Some places did open. 47 and a half though so I think that's kind of interesting I would assume this total goes up a little bit as you know the Boger news gets around as you've got public betters that are co- going to come in and play the over for this game uh, but you know as far as the current line at five you know like you said liked it at three and a half I've got it in the circa million and the super contest at three and a half at four maybe you're still looking San Francisco at five now it is tough because again if the expectation here is a higher scoring game that seems like both what you and I are thinking here, uh, then, you know, you got a little bit more variance into the equation. So should be a good one, at least after having some duds on Monday Night Football. At least we get a good one here this week. And I think Lions and Packers are a pretty good one next week, too. Yeah, this definitely should be a better game uh, once once you get the Bengals off Monday Night Football and some of the other teams <laughs> that we've had on uh, previous weeks. You see the Browns and 49ers. To be honest, I'm really looking forward to this game. And like you said, next week's game pretty good as well. It's really nice to have a good game on Monday night. It's it's hard when you have a full slate of games on Sunday and then you look forward to the game on Monday night and you see some of the games we've had lately. Real quick before we transition over to the college side, and, and we had a situation like this with Chris Ash and Rutgers uh, you know, this past weekend, but Washington fires Jay Gruden. Jay Gruden wanted out of that job. And and quite frankly, with how that organization is run, I can't blame him. Laid the big number with New England in the contests and came away with a win there in that one. But for Washington here going forward with Jay Gruden, a guy who, as I said, if you read between the lines, he didn't want to be there. You know, it was just, I think that he had kind of worn out his welcome. I think the players had, you know, probably kind of tuned him out a little bit. And also to... Some bad luck. I mean, Washington's had injury problems for the last several years, just something that they can't really shake. But 
As far as the Redskins go going forward, I mean, what do you think about them? They do play Miami here this week, so good chance at a win. But what do you think about them now with Gruden out of the picture? Well, I know a lot of people like to bet the the team who just fired the recent coach, especially if they think that uh, players didn't respect them that much. I do think that this is a difficult situation to know what to do as far as the first week. You've got Washington and Miami both of these teams kind of thinking, you know, maybe we finally have a chance to win a game. That's not a game that I want to bet. Uh, I, I want to stay as far away from that game as I possibly can. I, I thought that, you know, like what, what you said there was uh, true to me that Washington looked like a team where uh, Gruden looked like he was ready to be done. You know, I, I think that he saw the writing on the wall and said, OK, let's let's just get this over with. Um, you know, I, I think Washington has a little bit more talent than does Miami. Uh, and I would say that Washington could have some value as an underdog going forward here in the next few weeks. I hate to bet them as a favorite, though. So it's a team that I would avoid here this coming week. It's a game that I would avoid. But, you know, let's see if Washington plays hard. You know, maybe they maybe they do play harder for uh, the new coach and maybe we see a little bit of something different. I, I think that the quarterback situation there in Washington, though, is just such a huge question mark. Yeah, it is, and it's also going to impact the next coach that they wind up hiring because it, it seems like the front office really wants to push Dwayne Haskins, and you can understand why, especially seeing the success that air raid quarterbacks are having here this season. We know he's got a big arm, but you know, does he have the ability to break down defenses, audible at the line, make the right calls, change the right protections, all that kind of thing? That remains to be seen, so that's a tough job because someone's probably going to have to come in and work with that kid. and. You know, maybe that's something that they don't want to do. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there with the fallout. And by the way, as I mentioned, Chris Ash last week getting fired by Rutgers. They're a 14 and a half point home dog. They lose 48 to seven to a Maryland team that just got completely shellacked the week before by Penn State. So didn't really seem to help Rutgers last week. We'll see if it helps them here as they go forward. But pretty good week of college football here in week seven. Things start Wednesday night in the fun belt. Appalachian State and Louisiana Lafayette a game we will get to here in a few minutes, but we'll start with our quick hitters and talk about some betting nuggets, some stats, some trends, some regression teams, lots of good insight here to both explain some of the line moves that we're going to see, but also give you some starting points here for this week. Yeah. Baylor's really impressed me so far this year. That's where I wanted to start out 10th in the nation in yards per play margin so far this year. I think both of us really like Matt rule as a head coach. He, you know, now he's had some time, to build up what he wants here in this Baylor system. They're really doing a very good job. I don't know if there's been any update about Charlie Brewer, but certainly that's a situation that you want to watch. Uh, This is a team that's even better than I expected them to be. I like how uh, much improved they are on defense and they've been able to run the football as well. Though certainly that, you know, they want to have Brewer available. Yeah. Brewer definitely took some shots and, you know, there are a lot of quarterbacks here on the injury report this week, a lot of them. And I talked about them in my opening line report, sort of being surprised that some lines are up there on the board. A lot of lines weren't though, uh, for some of those games with those quarterback situations. But, you know, I think that we kind of talked about this when Matt rule was hired and you and I were both very high on the hire, not just because he could clean up the Baylor program, which we all know know, desperately needed a, a purge of sorts, but also that he would bring something different to the big 12. Baylor would be a physical team in the trenches, but now he's also got a quarterback in Brewer that fits. He's been able to recruit the state of Texas relatively well. It's a good mix there where, no, they're not an elite team by any means, but they're a very good team in this conference, and they're also a tough team to play because of their physicality. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, I think the good point there is that they're so much different than a lot of the other teams in the Big 12 I always like coaching staffs who come into a conference that, you know, just about everybody else is doing something uh, about the same way as every other team. And then you come in and do something a little bit differently and do it well. That's what he's been able to do here so far. Speaking Um, of that real quick, this isn't something we're going to talk about, but we mentioned Rutgers earlier. If I'm Rutgers, I'm hiring Ivan Jasper or I'm seeing if Paul Johnson wants to coach. I'm running the triple triple option option. because you cannot compete with Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State, Wisconsin, maybe eventually Nebraska if Scott Frost gets it going. Uh, you know, Iowa's good every year. You can't compete. So give them something different to look at and try and get your six wins and go to a bowl game every year. I'm, 
I think Rutgers is the perfect spot to run the triple option. And I, I don't think they do it, but I think it would be brilliant. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, what do they have to lose? I mean, they've just been losing games all the time, so you might as well try something different. Right. So, um, yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. I don't think they'll do it, but I'd like to see him do it. Um, the, the next one I had on my list here was Stanford, you know, Stanford off that surprising win against Washington. And I certainly didn't see that one coming. Um, I didn't have anything in that game, but I didn't expect that to happen. Stanford's 115th in a nation in yards per play margin at minus 1.21 yards per play. But here they come off that big upset win against Washington. The Pac-12 is really hard to figure out, other than obviously they're just not very good. Uh, At this point, you don't know who you should really trust in the Pac-12. No, I I have no idea. Stanford rolled up 482 yards on Washington in that game over the weekend. And... Here's the thing, right? Obviously, we know that Stanford is is all over the map, and, and they've had the quarterback injury with K.J. Costello. Davis Mills played pretty well in that game there on Saturday. What does this game say about Washington? Washington has now lost to a Stanford team that really struggled to beat Oregon State last week and obviously has had some of the other bad performances of this season. And they also lost at home to Cal, and Cal is an elite defense, but a very poor offense. Blowout BYU, blowout Hawaii blow out Eastern Washington. I I have no idea what Washington is at this point in time. And again, from a talent standpoint, I mean, they're a top 15 team in my power ratings, but I do not, they're a top 17 team, but I don't trust them at all. No, I don't either. And I I will say, I think some people may get a little bit too low low on Chris Peterson based on this. I still think he's a really good coach. Um, Washington lost a lot from last year. They lost a lot of defense, especially um, you know, they still have the offense. Eason uh, seems like he should have been a little bit better fit than what he's been so far this year. So been a little bit disappointed on that side of the ball. And the inconsistency of Washington on the road has really been uh, pretty striking here the last couple of seasons. But, you know, I like like I said, I don't I don't really trust anybody in the Pac-12 all that much. New Mexico State minus 14 in turnover margin so far this year. They're off a misleading final there against Liberty. And the first thing I, I said to myself as I saw that uh, final score and looked at the box score was, you know, of course, Liberty would get the cover the week after uh, I had them. And he, I know you had them as well um, against New Mexico. Then they go in a difficult spot against New Mexico State and win a misleading final there the next week. Yeah, and, and it's going to be a real interesting game for New Mexico State here this week. They play Central Michigan on Saturday on the road, which is a really weird place for them to go. I know they're an independent, so they pick their own schedule and they take whoever is willing to play them, but that's a real strange spot, really both ways, because Central Michigan just blew out Eastern Michigan in a rivalry game. Now they host New Mexico State, laying a pretty healthy number at that. So that's a really strange game all the way around there coming up on Saturday. Central Michigan, a double-digit favorite in that one. Yeah, Central Michigan, a double-digit favorite. If you look at the long-term forecast, which obviously a lot of things could change, low 40s with quite a bit of wind in that game. So um, definitely something that you would you would kind of think that would help Central Michigan, especially with New Mexico State on the long travel. But like you said, Central Michigan off a really big win against a an opponent that they would have been a lot more fired up to play against. Uh, versus New Mexico State. So uh, interesting handicap there, to be sure. Um, next on my list, I've got SMU is now plus 20 and sack margin on the year, plus 20. Really amazing. What a comeback from them last weekend. It's hard to say whether that was really a, uh, you know, a choke job by Tulsa or a really good job there by SMU, but that was uh, the most exciting game of the weekend. Yeah, how about SMU, man? Moving to 6-0 and and Again, uh, obviously very tough. Hell of a catch by James Proach, oh, too. And, yeah. and that's the thing, too, is that you know, this SMU team, they've got some power five transfers. Xavier Jones could be an NFL running back. I think Proach could be an NFL wide receiver. I don't think Bouchelle's an NFL quarterback, but, you know, guy originally recruited to Texas. This team has got a ton of talent. I don't know if the defense holds up throughout conference play, but this offense is legit. Absolutely. Very, very good offense here for SMU. Like you said, some great skill position players. I would think SMU will keep putting up some pretty big numbers. Uh, the totals are going to get higher and higher based on how high scoring their games have been. I do wonder about their defense, and they were fortunate to win there the other night against Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa had that kick to try to win it. 
uh, certainly questionable whether there should have been a uh, running into the kicker or roughing the kicker or something where Tulsa would have had a second chance, but they didn't get it. SMU ends up winning. Uh, interesting game there, certainly. The last uh, couple quick hitters, I'll say, couple bad, bad offenses. Miami of Ohio on offense, just 39 plays of 10 yards or more so far this year. Oklahoma has 120 in the same number of games. Now, certainly I'm not expecting Miami of Ohio to be Oklahoma on offense, but that's certainly pretty striking. The other one, Northwestern. Northwestern has nine plays of 20 yards or more so far this year. Uh, that one really, to me, stands out as just ridiculous. Western Michigan has 43 uh, the Wildcats defense scrappy, but this offense is awful. Hunter Johnson, probably the biggest disappointment in the country so far this year to me. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, again, that Northwestern defense keeps them in a lot of games. I mean, it's it's kind of a, a vintage Pat Fitzgerald type of team with a good defense and no quarterback play to speak of. But yeah, Miami of Ohio plays Western Michigan here this week, and that's an interesting line up from 11 to 13 and a half. Now, Western Michigan. First game, they beat Monmouth 48-13. to Second game, they lose to Michigan State 51-17. to Third game, they beat Georgia State 57-10. to Georgia State, by the way, just had 722 yards on Arkansas State this past weekend. Get blown out by Syracuse. Beat Central Michigan by 16 in a game that was much closer than the final score would suggest. Lose to Toledo last week. To see Western Michigan getting bet up with how inconsistent they've been here, is a commentary on that Miami of Ohio offense. So again, it's important to look for these stats because you can get out in front of some line moves here. If you're paying attention to what some of these statistics look like. Definitely. And I, I honestly, I think I agree with that line move there on Western Michigan. Miami just hasn't shown that they can score enough. Western Michigan should be able to score quite a few points in that game. So, you know, while the Western Michigan defense is weak, I, I don't know if Miami can keep up there. Well, and once again, we talk about trying to get out in front of line moves, and you can do that with power ratings. You can do that with box score study, but you can also do that looking for these areas of regression. And I love when we talk about these on the show. Uh, they're always a lot of fun to discuss. And also, you know, a lot of times you look at the odd screen and you can see these games moving. And it's not to say that they're exclusively based on these regression metrics that we're talking about, but simply to say that they certainly are part of the equation here. And we start with the Duke Blue Devils. Yeah, I think this is, uh, you know, my favorite uh, stuff to talk about on the show. I really like these regression stats in college football. Um, we see, like you said, a lot of line moves based off these. And you see things that, you know, um, you want to see what you should be looking for, not just for this week, but for next week. You know, when you start looking at box scores, what kind of things really stand out to you? Um, this kind of goes along with the misleading finals and things like that. So, uh, yeah, the Duke offense uh, they're due for some negative regression. If you look at them, they're 99th in yards per play so far this year, but they're 46th in points per game. They do play fairly fast, but I would consider taking unders here. I don't like fading a great coach like Cutcliffe. He's been really good in the underdog role, especially, you know, I, I don't mind going against Duke if they're favored by a decent amount, but in the underdog role, I hate to fade them. I do think there could be some unders coming up for them because the Duke defense is pretty solid, but I don't think the offense is, is as good as they look so far. And, and this could be one of those weeks where we look at an under here against the Georgia Tech team that is just completely inept on offense. But Duke, an 18-and-a-half-point favorite here this week. Again, that number completely deserved, but as you said, you know this is a team that is overachieving a little bit on the offensive side relative to their yards per play. Absolutely. Um, LSU. LSU's offense is really good. This one really stood out to me, though, when I was looking at these yesterday. LSU has 31 trips into the red zone so far this year. They have 31 scores. Um, you almost never see that. 26 touchdowns. Not sustainable. Um, LSU can't keep, keep up that kind of rate in the red zone. Certainly a very good offense, to be sure, but um, that's something that has to regress at least somewhat. Take a wild guess here. Who do you think the number one team is in red zone defense in terms of score percentage against? Uh, Florida. Yes. And that's who LSU plays here this week. Florida allowing scores on just five of 14 red zone trips, 35.7%, 17% better than anybody else in the country. So there's also negative regression coming for Florida in that department too. They've only given up a touchdown in three of 14 red zone trips for the opposition. So 
battling regression metrics here. And that's already an interesting game for a variety of different reasons. But uh, add that to the mix. It's something else to consider. Yeah, I mean, Florida's defense has only given up points of any kind on five of 14 trips into the red zone for opponents. So, gosh, I mean, there, there's no way that can continue. So, yeah, it's interesting to see those two matching up, certainly. Uh, Georgia Southern, a team, really stands out to me on offense. And and you and I were even chatting about this a little bit before uh, the show here. Georgia Southern's box score from last weekend's game is really kind of uh, puzzling. You know, you don't see stuff like that very often. But Georgia Southern converting on 25% of third downs. To me, this is extremely rare to see an option offense with that kind of uh, percentage on third down. Second worst in the country. It's been ugly. And and I mean, Shy Wirtz was hurt early on in the season, did miss uh, the game against, it wasn't, I think he missed part of the game against Minnesota, but it was also the game the week before that where, uh, you know, he wasn't able to go. They had to go with, I think, a redshirt freshman or something like that. But still, you know, Georgia Southern, and this is interesting, too, because, you know, last year they were so strong. They make that switch from Tyson Summers to Chad Lunsford, and now they are regressing a little bit on the offensive side. And as you said, it should get better. But also, too, I kind of looked at this when it came to Navy, and I've talked about this a lot. Navy's better than I thought this year. I've had to upgrade them in my power ratings. But when you're an option or, you know, some sort of gimmicky-type offensive team, and all of a sudden you become part of a conference – or you switch conferences, those teams start to catch up. And, and for Georgia Southern here, a lot of non-conference games in the mix. But you know, that game last week, South Alabama had four first downs. In that game, they were 0 for 10 on third down and took Georgia Southern to double overtime. So a lot of red flags for the Eagles, to be sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's that that kind of box score is really uh, four first downs and goes into overtime. That was really something. Um if, if you look at Pittsburgh on defense, they're 11th in the nation in yards per play allowed, but 45th in points per game allowed. Positive regression likely coming here. I'll look for Pittsburgh unders here going forward. They're a team that talked about playing faster this year. They're playing faster than they have in, in the past, but still not really that fast. I think Pitt could have some lower scoring games here. If we get numbers that are high enough, I'll look to take some Pitt Panthers unders. I thought it was nice to see Kenny Pickett come back and play a really good game for them against Duke because they sat him out against Delaware, set out six starters in that game against Delaware, which wound up being way too close for comfort. But a nice bounce back there. And you know what? It's time for that pit defense to look pretty good because you hire a guy like Pat Narduzzi and what happens on offense happens on offense. You hope he has a good OC. You hope that they're able to recruit well. But you would expect a Narduzzi team to be much better defensively than Pitt has been the last few years. Maybe it's finally starting to take hold. Yeah, and I'll be honest. I'm kind of surprised that, you know, based on the injury to, um, isn't I think it's Weaver that was going to be their best player on the defensive line before the season. I kind of expected this defense wasn't going to be great. And then now they've been very, very good on defense so far this year. So I'm a little bit surprised that this is the year that it happened. You know, I thought in past years they were going to be a lot better and then kind of thought that this year that they wouldn't be that good on defense. But now they seem to be turning a corner. Maybe it's just been long enough and uh, he's got the players he wants and they understand the scheme better. But certainly Pitt on defense has been very impressive so far this year. Wake Forest defense allowing 25% on third down conversion so far this year. This defense is going to regress. They're 73rd in the nation in yards per play allowed and only 35th in points per game allowed. So Wake Forest, not a team I'm really anxious to go against. I really like their coaching staff in general, but I think Wake Forest could be a team that we see some overs with going forward because this defense isn't as good as they've looked so far. Yeah, and I don't know what this total is going to look like this week for Louisville and Wake Forest. I'll try to pull it up and see what the Circa opener was on it. But that's a game where we could see a ton of points because when you look at the box, it was 64 and a half at the circle, which I think is low for that game. Last week, Louisville had 665 yards against Boston College. We know Wake Forest can move the football. So that's what I might be looking at here as totals open up on Monday afternoon, Louisville and Wake Forest over the total. Yeah, I can't disagree with that at all. You know, especially the way Wake Forest pushes tempo. They're 13th in the nation in tempo. Uh, Louisville's offense has been far better than I thought they'd be. They're 18th in the nation in yards per play so far this year. 
I got a little bit lucky, I think, with that Boston College cover. We took them in the Golden Nugget. That line came down from six to four. Uh, Anthony Brown also got hurt in that game for Boston College. Non-contact knee injury, and it looked bad. So he's probably going to be out, I would say, for the rest of the year. It looked like an ACL uh, for Anthony Brown there at Boston College. So definitely something to factor into the equation. We'll talk about power ratings in a second. One other quick note for me here, a couple of regression things. Army and Maryland, opposing kickers against Army and Maryland, both one for five on field goals. Oregon wow. State and Toledo, the opposition, four for 10 on field goals against both of them. So maybe those teams getting a little bit fortunate. And of course, too, missed field goals could increase, you know, how your numbers look in the red zone, as we kind of talked about already uh, with a team like Florida. So just some things to keep in mind here. Again, only three points at a time, but you know, can make some things look better than they actually are. No, I, I like those stats, stats a lot because, you know, we see how many of these games come down to one, two, three points ATS at the end. So uh, I think those are really important to point out. You know, there's only so much you can do uh, defending a field goal. So it's kind of like in uh, college basketball, the old free throw defense. Well, and if things didn't suck enough for Colorado State and Tennessee, kickers 10 for 10 against Colorado State, Nine for nine against Tennessee here on the season. Those are the highest numbers with 100% make rates. New Mexico State also teams 13 of 14 against them. So New Mexico State has had no luck whatsoever here so far this season. Um, let's talk about some power rating stuff here real quickly. I know that there were some teams you adjusted up, some teams you moved down a little bit. I'll uh, just compare notes on those, and then we'll get into some of these weeknight games. Yeah, first off, San Jose State, I moved up three and a half points. You know, I really like that San Jose State's having a nice year this year. Um, that coaching staff really uh, took took that team in a bad spot. You know, um, Brennan, I believe is his name. If, if I got it wrong, you can correct me. But um, this is a San Jose State team that had nothing going right. Um, you know, this is a team that nobody thought would be as good as they've been so far this year. I like seeing teams like this and stories like this where finally, you know, a coaching staff – is able to turn something around when you thought that it was never going to happen. So San Jose State, a team that I moved up three and a half points, and I, I kind of wonder if that's even enough. Yeah, I moved San Jose State up three points. They were one of my bigger movers here this week. I, I was a little bit slow to react on them, I think. And, you know, maybe I was just pissed off because I had Air Force in that game where I, I don't know how Air Force didn't cover the number. Uh -huh. Well, I know how. They went for a fourth down at their own 22. That's how they didn't cover the number. Um, but, yeah, San Jose State definitely looks better. and. There's a lot of talent out there in California. If they're able to get some of the decent talent that's out there, a couple three stars here and there, some high two stars, that'll play in the Mountain West. So, you know, hopefully Brennan and his coaching staff can keep doing some pretty good things there. A few teams that I moved up pretty, pretty substantially. I bumped Central Michigan up six points. I was on them in the Nugget last week. I thought they could win the game outright. They dominated the game. And Jim McElwain, is doing great things there in Mount Pleasant. So Central Michigan got a big upgrade from me. Also, Oregon State, Tulsa, and then Ball State all moved up four points for me. But I got to say, overall, I don't know if there's a single MAC team that I didn't move this week. I clearly did not know how to rate that conference coming into the year. It's been very inconsistent overall. But the MAC is just, I, all these teams just seem interchangeable week in and week out to me. So I guess I just didn't have most of them rated well. Yeah, I moved up Central Michigan four and a half points. And I have to tell you that this is one of the games that last week I, I'm most upset that I didn't take. I had an overlay there with Central Michigan. I didn't trust my lean there enough. And and then, of course, they, they look great and absolutely blow out their rivals. So disappointed in that one. I moved them up four and a half points. Tulsa up three and a half points. As far as some of the movers down, I uh, moved down Vanderbilt four points. I had Vanderbilt and Ole Miss over. That was a game where I got over 58 last week. I believe it closed 64, 64 and a half. So, you know, um, this is one of those games where you see six, six and a half point line move in your favor. Uh, certainly is encouraging. And then, of course, Vanderbilt can't do anything at all. You know, Ole Miss could have scored a lot more if they really needed to in that game. Vanderbilt's a lot worse than I thought they were going to be. Northern Illinois moved down three and a half points. Kansas State then moved down three points. So those are some of the disappointing teams to me. I would say that Kansas State, uh, pretty poor performance there last week. Uh, a team that it's hard to know what to make in, in the first year of Chris Kleiman. I think he's certainly a very good coach. But uh, I think th that was a pretty poor showing there against Baylor. 
it was a really poor showing, especially when you consider Kansas State was off of a bye right. and Baylor was off of a really big home win where you know they had to hold on in the fourth quarter there against Iowa State. For Kleiman and his team to look like that coming off of a bye, especially when you consider what happened in that Oklahoma State game where they gave up like 975 rushing yards or something like that, you really wanted to see a bounce back there, and we didn't get it. And there were actually quite a few teams this week coming off of buys that just laid huge eggs. And that's just such a big red flag for me, especially if you have a first-year head coach or a second-year head coach, and you come off of a buy and look like shit, it's really hard for me to get over that. Yeah, and we're going to talk about one of them here again in a few minutes in the games. But, um, yeah, I agree with you as far as the the bye week and then show up with a a really poor performance. Uh, You have to downgrade teams like that. So the other teams I moved down, same ones as you. Kansas State was two and a half. Vanderbilt was four. Northern Illinois went down three. I also moved Purdue down four more points because, A, I guess I I didn't adjust enough last week to all the injuries. And, B, when you look at what they ran out there last week, you've got to move them down again because it was just not a good showing against Penn State at all whatsoever. Um, I moved Texas A&M down three points because once the line came out for that game against Alabama, my line was more like 14, 14 and a half or so. And I clearly wasn't in line with the market. And Alabama's 99 in my power ratings. They're number one in the country uh, by four and a half points, I think, over Ohio State. So I guess I was just a little bit too high on A&M and Maybe I didn't adjust A&M down enough for some of their performances in SEC play a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I moved A&M down two and a half as well. So um, not a spot where I'd want to be backing A&M there. So uh, if you have an overlay there on Texas A&M, that, that's one of them that I would have wanted to avoid, so, certainly, because uh, you know, A&M to me has been a pretty big disappointment, too, with a, a Jimbo Fisher, a team uh, that you would think is very well coached. Kellen Mond. Uh, a veteran quarterback, but really he hasn't played very well in big games in his career. Well, and again, real quickly to run through some of these names here, because there are a lot of them and it's very hard to find concrete college football injury news. There's no standardization with the injury reports. The coaches don't really have to provide anything if they don't want to. If it's a guy who's out for the year, somebody who's a big name, usually that comes out, but Charlie Brewer at Baylor, you've got, Kyle Trask was dinged up at Florida. He'll play, but he was dinged up. Jaron Williams is hurt for Miami. He threw a bunch of picks in the first quarter uh, against Virginia Tech last week. Adrian Martinez for Nebraska. Noah Vedral could be better than him at this point in time anyway, but I guess we'll kind of wait and see with that. Ryan Holinsky at South Carolina. He's got an elbow injury. He's still banged up. Davis Mills was on the injury report this week. Uh, You've also got Anthony Brown, I mentioned, at Boston College. Brandon Peters at Illinois. He's got his revenge game this week against Michigan. Doesn't look like he'll be able to play in that one. Uh, Kelly Bryant was dinged up. He's expected to be okay. But Missouri, you know, they really need him. He's played pretty well this year. Josh Jackson for Maryland. He went out last week. So lots of quarterback injuries. Uh, Arthur Sitkowski at Rutgers. He's going to redshirt and leave the program. It's that time of the year for that, too, with the new redshirt rules with playing four games. Skill position, guys. Try to do the best you can to find injury information. It's not easy, but there are a lot of big names, especially skill position guys on the injury report this week. Definitely. And I think Brown from Boston College is a really key injury for them because they're not very deep at quarterback. And, uh, you know, having a veteran like that really helped them quite a bit. That's a team that I'd be very afraid to back here going forward. All right. So we break down some games here. We start on Wednesday night in the fun belt and damn it. I love this game. This may be my favorite game of the week. I know there's a lot of good games out there this week, but this one could be very, very fun on Wednesday night in Lafayette. Louisiana's a three point favorite against Appalachian state. And a few interesting things about this game. First and foremost, it's the Sun Belt in a standalone game on Wednesday night. Appalachian state is the household name. Louisiana is not, and this line's gone up from minus one to minus three. And the second is when these Sunbelt teams get their chance in the spotlight, it means a lot to them. And there's no team with a bigger bullseye on its back ever in Sunbelt play than the Appalachian State Mountaineers. This is a great game. I love this game. This is is one of the best midweek games we'll get. Um, You know, I, I like the spot here for Louisiana like you said, going against an App State team that has a target on their back. 
You know, if, if I was getting plus points here, I'd want to take Louisiana. I don't want to lay three points with them here. I see Bet Online has a total up of 70 in this game. And I want to say that this is an under system that I've talked about in the past. Game five, five through seven, where both teams have had more than 50% of their games go over, play the under. This is kind of overreaction-based inflated totals. In games five through seven, this system is 220 and 161, 57.7%. When the total is 55 and a half or higher, which is pretty much an average total, the under is 164 and 111, 59.6%. So this one definitely fits that. Both these teams have been going over the total by quite a bit, actually. Uh, 70 is a high number for two teams that are running all the time. So my biggest lean here in this game would be the under. I have to say that you know, I really like what Louisiana is doing as far as running the football. They've been really, really good on the ground. I think Napier is an underrated coach that probably will have a different job here before too long. App State, to me, a team where you look at that team, they look a little bit different than they have in past years. Their defense has not been nearly as good. Uh, that's a concerning thing, certainly, about taking an under, but it is 70. You know, I mean, it's just basically a numbers grab if I take the under there. Like you said, you know, this is really um, – App State's had a target on their back here. Uh, Louisiana hasn't been as good as them. They lost to them there last year in that title game. I, I think Louisiana really wants this game a lot, but, I mean, can you really lay minus three? I don't think so. I mean, I think if you got in on this one before it got to a field goal, I think you could make a much stronger case for it. My line's basically about pick them here. I, I've got it, you know, really Appalachian State minus a half a point. So essentially pick them for me. And look, App State's defense has not played well. As you mentioned, 5.9 yards per play allowed is just not App State football. They were like, what, 4.2 yards per play or 4.3 yards per play allowed last year. Of course, you don't have Scott Satterfield anymore. Maybe Eli Drinkwitz worries a little bit more about the offensive side. Maybe they're a little bit more risk-taking of a defense. I don't know. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure what to think about this game because when you look up and down the teams that App State has played so far this year, a lot of really good passing offenses. You, know, you talk about playing against a team like North Carolina, for example. Coastal Carolina throws the football pretty well. Charlotte, maybe a little bit more of a running team, but you know, their offense has improved this year with uh, with will healy louisiana runs the football so does app state match up better against louisiana than they would against some of those teams that spread them out and throw the ball around i think it's a possibility so i'd be wary of being quick to lay the number with louisiana here i don't know if i'd play three and a half on app state but i think this is a game where maybe you kind of get into one of those situations where you still have to knock that team off the top of the mountain. And if Louisiana does it good for them, if they don't, it's because app state is just the class of this conference and has been. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, this is a spot where, like I said, I, I would have wanted to back Louisiana, but you know, the line, the line's gotten out of control. And I, I think Louisiana at five and O ATS, I'm not sure if there's any other teams left that are unbeaten. I, I know app state's, done pretty well ATS so far this year. But, you know, when you get a team that's 5-0 and ATS on the year, it's hard to continue to see value on them. You know, everybody sees that they're that good. And, you know, it, it then gets the price out of control a little bit. I will say something I thought was interesting here. I was pulling it up as you were talking. These teams played twice last year. The total of 65 in the first game, 54 in the second game. And uh, they finished at 44 and 49. So, I mean, I would expect this game to be higher scoring than those, but you know, let's see how this how high this total is throughout the course of the week. Appalachian State has given up 4.3 yards per carry on the season, but they have the they're tied for the tenth fewest rushing attempts against at 152. Now they have only played four games, so obviously this is going to go up. Most of the teams around them have played five, but still, it's simply to say that they haven't faced a whole lot of running offenses yet. Again, maybe that does help them here defensively because they're usually one of the best teams in the Sun Belt in the trenches. So, you know, quite possibly that could help them. And in fact, as we're talking here, this line, the odd screen lighting up, number coming down to Appalachian State plus two and a half. So somebody out there does like them, is getting a little bit of a buyback point here uh, with plus three at most places in the market. Staying in the Sun Belt, going to Thursday night here, game 105-106, Louisiana-Monroe on the road at Texas State. 
two and a half or three point favorite out there. And I don't think you and I were originally going to talk about this game. No offense to these two teams, but as we both looked at it a little bit more, there's kind of a clearly defined side we both like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard not to like Monroe in this game. The way to beat Texas State is by running the football. Uh, Texas State has a good secondary week in the front seven. Monroe does very well running the football. They're 17th in the nation in yards per carry so far this year. Texas State 107th at stopping the run so far this season. Lots of tempo in this game. Um, I would certainly lean to the over as well at over 62 or so. You've got a Monroe team that you know, has played a decent schedule here, um, did well there against Memphis moving the football. Um, you know, obviously their defense wasn't too great in that one, but it was Memphis. Uh, Texas State is in the better spot as far as a bye week, and I will point out that uh, something I was mentioning to you there before the show, uh, you notice that teams off a of bye week starts mattering more this time of the year. A team with a winning percentage of 50% or higher with 11 days or more between games who is up against a team with eight days or less is 53.2% ATS from week six on. So um, if they're an underdog or are favored by nine points or less, it goes to 55.5% ATS. Now, Texas State's not a good team, so this is not a great example of that, but it's just something to keep in mind that you know teams who are pretty good teams coming off a of bye week this time of the year um, can be pretty good to back. I think the Texas State's offense with uh, Bob Stitt there is going to improve over the course of the season. Uh, they've had some real turnover problems, but I do think that Texas State's defense uh, so weak against the run makes me want to bet Monroe here. And I think that this, the fact that Monroe is coming off a big game uh, against a high, highly ranked opponent is probably the reason that the number is only minus two and a half here, but it's hard to look any other way than, than uh, laying the, the short number here with Monroe. Yeah, I think Monroe's just a better team all the way around. And and I understand that, you know, it is a little bit of a tricky spot. They should have covered against Memphis. I went ahead and took Monroe in that game. I figured Memphis wouldn't be overly engaged. Memphis has a 68-yard touchdown run. The next play is a pick six. It turns a close game into a blowout. And then Monroe, I think, was just kind of deflated at that point. The balloon kind of popped. And that was that. They wound up failing to cover that number. Um, but again, I just, I, I don't think Texas state is, is really ready for this type of game yet against a Monroe team that was improved last year and has been improved this year. I think Matt Vieter is doing a really good job there with that team. Again, extra prep time for Texas state, but, uh, I already took minus two on the bet online opener. I don't think I'll double down at two and a half, but I, I do like Monroe a little bit there uh, in that game on Thursday night, the earlier of the two games, but the one that's further down the board by rotation number Game 107-108, Syracuse and NC State. Interesting to see this line go from minus three with some dog juice up to three and a half here. So NC State looks to be the preferred side early in the week. This is a really tough game for me. You know, you you take a Syracuse team that really I thought was going to be better than what they are. Um, And, you know, if we go back and look at that Syracuse loss to Maryland now, You kind of think, what happened in that game? Uh, You know, that that was really just a strange one. Syracuse, a team that, you know, offensively, I'm pretty surprised they they haven't been better than they've been. You know, this is a a coaching staff that you think is a very good offensive coaching staff. Uh, Normally, when you see these two teams in total, what, you know, Circa put out and what Bet Online has right now, I I would be thinking I want to take the over. But, you know, the efficiencies of both of these offenses have not been very good. Um, a Syracuse, the advantage they have here in this one is their third in special teams, according to S and P, uh, NC state is 46th. I, I have nothing here as far as a, a line value. I have this one at four. I will say that even though my, my power ratings have uh, NC state minus four, I think if I had to play this game, I would probably take Syracuse plus the points and we'll see if it gets to four or four and a half here. But, um, you know, I like Babers. I think that that team will improve. And I don't know what I'm going to get out of NC State. You know, their quarterback position has been a weakness here. Um, To me, this is a game with enough unknown that I would rather take the points. I've got this one, NC State, minus six and a half. And and maybe I just have too much respect for Dave Doran and and what he's been able to do. Um, For NC State, you know, I I was probably a little bit too high on them coming into the season. They lost Ryan Finley. They lost a thousand yard rusher. They lost like 2000 yard receivers. So, a lot of offensive losses for NC State. 
Then Matthew McKay came out and played pretty well in the first two games. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, I won't make too many adjustments to them. Now it's not even McKay's job anymore, as it looks like Bailey Hockman, a Florida State transfer, seems to be the guy who's going to be in that starting role now as we go forward. I did wind up taking the majority of the reps last week on the game against Florida State. For Syracuse, I think I may be a little bit too low on them because Tommy DeVito did not play well at the outset of the season. He's played much better here of late, seems to have gotten a little bit more comfortable in the offense here for Babers. Like Eric Dungy, he's been banged up all year long. Dungy was always hurt. DeVito, same thing. He was flexing his elbow the last time they played a game. So even though I've got a little bit of an overlay and this line is kind of moving in my direction, I don't think I'm going to have too much interest in it just because we may be five games in, but I'm still not too confident in what these two teams are. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, these are two teams where you kind of expect uh, – Uh, you could kind of expect the unexpected. We don't really know what to think of these two teams yet. And like you said, I don't really like teams that were this far into the season and I don't really know what to make of them. All right. So we move to Friday here, but we stay in the ACC, Virginia and Miami, Miami, a one point favorite here. And as I look at my power ratings, I've got Miami a three and a half point favorite. So obviously I haven't adjusted Miami down enough, but another year, another disappointing hurricanes team. Yeah, I have pick in this one. I'm probably higher on Virginia than you are here. Um, This is a team where I want to be high on Virginia. I know that they haven't played as well as uh, some people would think that they would play. They are minus six in turnover margin. So I think this Virginia team's a little bit better than what they look like. Like you said, Miami's been really disappointing. And they're a team that, this is the team I said that we talk about later, coming off a bye week. Um, and really off a win against Central Michigan where they won, what, 12-7 to 7 or something really low-scoring close game, you'd think they'd be really, really up for that game against Virginia Tech. I know Virginia Tech um, had that bad loss the week before, but I feel like it's not a great coaching job if you can't be up for a game like that after you just had a disappointing performance the week before. So definitely some worrying signs there for Miami, for me. And this is a Virginia team that, that comes into this game with a week off after a loss to Notre Dame that was a little bit misleading just because they had such a a big negative turnover margin. I think they were minus four or minus five in that game. So I would want to take Virginia in this one. The the problem for me is I would want to get a better line than this. And it's kind of disappointing that Miami played so well last week or played so poorly last week that now we get this line because if they had played better, we could have been getting Virginia plus three, plus three and a half, I think. What about you? Yeah, I think so, too. And and that's about where I have the line, you know, Miami three and a half. So, again, I, I probably under adjusted. And, you know, I mean, Nikosi Perry, who came in and threw for 400 yards last week against Virginia Tech, he couldn't keep this job. You know, a redshirt freshman and Jaron Williams beat him out for this gig. So you can't really be too excited about that. Two weeks or three weeks ago, I guess it would be now that Miami Central Michigan game 17 to 12. Miami was one for 10 on third down. And they had 34 carries for 51 yards against a MAC team. Wow. And that was a Central Michigan team that, you know, coming into the season, nobody really thought anything of. I think I've moved them up 10 points or something like that or so from where I had them coming into the season. So that's a really bad look for Miami. And I think Virginia, I think what's hard about teams like Virginia is they just, they're not flashy. You know, Bryce Perkins can be a flashy player, a dual threat type of guy. But for being a top 25 team, you know, really a consensus top 20 team you know, for a lot of people in the power ratings coming into the year, they just haven't, they haven't done anything to hurt it, but they haven't done anything to help it. And I think teams like that become an afterthought to the point where maybe I adjusted them down and then just never went back to adjusting them back up. So that's probably the discrepancy in the line here for me, where again, I have no interest in taking Miami, even though I've got an overlay around a key number. Yeah, and I I think one other thing I'd like to point out here is Virginia special teams 51st, according to S&P, Miami 109. So another advantage there for Virginia in this one. Like I said, I want to bet Virginia. I can't bet them only at uh, one point. So we'll see what happens with this line, but I would kind of expect that most people would want to take Virginia. So I I don't think this one's going to move in Miami's favor. And let's be honest here, too. If you're a team like Miami, right, and you're recruiting three and four star guys, you get the occasional five star, I'm sure. But most of your roster is going to be high two, 
three or you know low end four star types of guys and you're bad on special teams that's embarrassing because those underclassmen who come in as three and four star recruits they're playing special teams unless you're redshirting them how can you be that bad with that level of athleticism on special teams that's a coaching issue and we were worried about manny diaz coming into the season anyway good defensive coordinator but how does he do overseeing all three facets of the game well, the offense hasn't been great. The special teams are bottom 30 in college football with three and four star dudes running around on kick and punt coverage and also obviously in the return game. That's a real big damnation, I think, of Miami and where they are right now. I think it is definitely. Um, you know, you, you can't be a team like Miami, like you said, with that much talent and be that bad on special teams without it being a, a, a bad mark on the coaching staff. You know, I mean, uh, maybe you could have a bad kicker uh, miss a decent amount of field goals or something like that. But overall, they're just bad in special teams in general. So it's not just one area of special teams that's been a weakness for them. So certainly something to keep in mind as you go forward. Well, a game that we don't have to spend too much time on here because really neither one of us knows what to do with this handicap. Game 111-112, Colorado State and New Mexico. Colorado State, a road favorite for the second time in two years. I think it happened four or five times in 2017 when they were actually a pretty decent team uh, but they're a four point favorite here in albuquerque against new mexico and uh i i'm very i mean my number is colorado state minus six but i don't know what to do here yeah i mean i was trying to figure out uh you know when i knew that we were going to do all these weeknight games i was trying to figure out how you're going to build this up as you know kind of an interesting game because it's really it's really hard to i mean this is this is a game where I can't imagine betting this game. I mean, I guess if I had to bet this game, I'd probably bet the over. But the concern for me here is you're going to have a really high total and two teams who don't play very fast. I will say these defenses are really, really bad. Colorado State has allowed 37 plays of 20 yards or more so far this year. New Mexico has allowed 33 plays of 20 yards or more. And New Mexico has also given up 10 plays of 50 yards or more, which, uh, you know, at this point in the season, if you've given up 10 plays of 50 yards or more, you got some serious problems uh, in the secondary. So to me, this is a New Mexico team. I, I could, could not bet, but, you know, how could you get excited about laying the points with Colorado State? Uh, like you said, I, I have Colorado State here minus five. So a little bit of an edge here with Colorado State, but I don't want to lay the points with them on the road. So I've got nothing that I want to bet here. I mean, if, you know, if push came to shove or for people that are maybe out there in contests or, you know, ATS contests or pools or something like that, I mean, look, Colorado State's played the 55th ranked schedule, according to Sager, and New Mexico's played the 117th. Colorado State, they lost to Colorado, but outgained the Buffaloes in that game, beat Western Illinois, lost to Arkansas in a game that was tie in the fourth quarter, where Arkansas just kind of scored 21 late points and, you know, uh, sort of saved from getting embarrassed there. Played Toledo. Toledo's usually a pretty decent MAC team. Lost that game by six at home. At Utah State, only lost by 10. Then lost to San Diego State 24 to 10 last week with that 3 3 5 Rocky Long stack. And, you know, Patty O'Brien just didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't run the football. So Colorado State has played a much, much tougher schedule. So I guess I could maybe make a case for taking the Rams here if it comes down to three and a half or three. It wouldn't be a play I would love, but if I wanted some action on Friday night, and we all know that we want action out there, I guess I could do the mental gymnastics to put Colorado State on my card. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that that's some, some kind of uh, mental gymnastics. And I would say, you know, to be fair, I, I don't want anything to do with New Mexico. I mean, the coaching staff there and, you know, how they still have the same coaching staff that they've had for the last few years to me is kind of, uh, you know, I, it's hard for me to imagine that, that Bob Davey is still the head coach there. So to me, uh, Colorado State or nothing, but I, I, it, it would be nothing for me here. Like you said, if you have to have some kind of action or you're in some kind of ATS pool, would probably lay the points here with Colorado State just because New Mexico has shown that they can't stop anybody and they really haven't played anybody very good, like you said. Well, I guess I will say this. I mean, we, we got to have something of substance here for, for talking about this game at Liberty at San Jose State on a short week, and then you host Colorado State, and then next weekend, New Mexico's on the road at Wyoming. I don't like Wyoming. I will be very uncomfortable laying a number with Wyoming. <laughs> I will be laying a Wyoming number from a situational standpoint next weekend. Yeah, I mean, I can't blame you. I don't like Wyoming either, and that, that'd be a hard bet to make. But 
what a brutal schedule. I mean, I don't, I don't know how New Mexico's, uh, you know, the person in charge of setting up New Mexico's schedule did them no favors this year. This isn't really a very good spot for New Mexico. And like you said, next week, a really bad spot for them. All right, so we head to Eugene here, Colorado and Oregon. And again, we talk about teams, you know, coming off of a bye week, just not looking very good. Colorado Buffaloes, you know, I mean, just not really a good showing last week uh, against Arizona. And you you wanted to see more, you know, you wanted to have some level of expectation there from a first year head coach in Mel Tucker and Khalil Tate drops a 400 yard game on them and they lose at home to Arizona and Arizona team. It's been very inconsistent as well. Now the Buffaloes go on the road as almost a three touchdown dog against Oregon. Yeah, this is one of those Pac-12 games where you say, what what am I supposed to expect uh, in the Pac-12 at this point? Um, you know, Colorado is 122nd in the nation in yards per play allowed. I know some people said before the year, look, they've got a defensive-minded coach. Uh, Colorado's defense is going to be pretty good. They lost a lot of people from last year's defense. Um, th- this defense has been really bad. You know, if you look at who they've played against, You could make the argument that they've faced some pretty good offenses, but certainly nothing earth shattering. And to me, uh, Colorado is going to give up a lot of big plays, especially in the passing game. Uh, Oregon's offense has been a bit disappointing to me as well, especially with uh, a quarterback who some people think could be uh, picked very highly in the NFL draft. Um, Oregon's defense, though, is the difference to me here. Oregon has been really, really good on defense. Fifth in yards per play allowed. Uh, They're fourth in opponents QBR. Colorado wants to throw the ball a lot, and I don't think they're going to have very much success doing it here. Uh, The only way I could bet this game would be laying the number as far as the side. I will say that I kind of like the under in this game. Oregon, uh, while they play fairly fast, has not been particularly efficient on offense. And uh, when they get the lead, they have been pretty conservative here in the past. So if we get a high 50s number in this one, I would lean to the under based on the fact that I'm not sure Colorado is going to keep scoring the kind of points that they have here in recent weeks. Because if you look at the defenses that Colorado has faced, they haven't faced a defense even close to as good as Oregon's. This is one of those games where if Colorado doesn't keep pace, this game can get away from them in a hurry. And, And that's why I think this 20 and a half point spread is justified. I have it 23 personally, but I'm not really eager to go out there and play this game. However, I can say The Oregon defensive point is a really good one, especially with Andy Avalos, who was the defensive coordinator at Boise State previously, appears to be a home run hire for them. And again, to give you a little bit of substance, because I don't think either one of us is really jazzed about playing this game in particular, the Pac-12 is a shit show. It's it's a mess. (laughs) It just is. Next week, Oregon's at Washington. And for some reason, I won't be the least bit surprised if Washington beats Oregon in that game after losing to Cal and Stanford. But maybe that Oregon defense is the difference maker there, taking a top five unit up to Seattle. So that's what I'm kind of interested in here, too. You know, we don't have many look ahead spots going into into week eight. I kind of looked at this here this morning real quickly. That is one where if Oregon is up big in the second half of this game, they can put it in cruise control. So if you like Oregon to do what they want to do, and they certainly could, I think a first half play is probably what you want to be looking at. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, And really, if you look at Oregon's schedule, they've got a really interesting schedule the next few weeks. They play at Washington, then Washington State at home, and then at USC. So uh, tough schedule here coming up. Oregon, I guess if you, you know, if you really wanted to stretch it and say, you know, the Pac-12 has some chance of getting in the playoffs, which, I mean, it's not going to happen. But, you know, Oregon would be the last hope that they have. So, you know, if you look at Oregon, I think they're a team that has potential high upside, but they haven't been consistent enough on offense. And, you know, some of their wins that they've had so far this season, you wonder really how good those wins are. Even the blowout in Nevada, you know, Nevada has looked really bad since then. So, you know, that wasn't as impressive as it seemed at the time. Um, I do kind of like the under in this game, and I kind of like the under – Uh, going forward next week at Washington. You know, Washington's a team that doesn't play particularly fast. I think that could be a a relatively low-scoring close game. But I think the bigger story about this game is I I don't think Colorado is as good as some people think here this season. So uh, like you, my number's higher on this one. Um, I kind of like Oregon, and I I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, like you said, to play Oregon first half or maybe Colorado team total under or something like that. 
Yeah, and if we want to look at situational spots heading into week eight, I guess I'll throw this one out there, even though we didn't talk about this game. or Well, we did talk a little bit about Florida with that game this week against LSU and some of the red zone regression going both ways. That's a tough spot next weekend at williams Bryce against South Carolina, who's not a great team by any means, but they're still a pretty decent team. And that's a scary game coming off of Auburn on the road at LSU, a bye week, and then the cocktail party against Georgia the following week. I think that's a spot to maybe take South Carolina, especially if they're getting points next week uh, in that week eight game. So just some things for you to consider as we start thinking about our week eight college football first look segment next week. I guess one last thing I'll ask you about here. I'm sure you're still trying to digest the card and put together your totals numbers and everything. Is there a game on Saturday that kind of catches your eye right now that you just want to leave our listeners with here? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Oh, sorry about that. I said, uh, you know, I, I know that you're working through your totals projections and, and kind of, you know, narrow, navigating your way through the card here. Is there any play on Saturday that you kind of have your sights set on for right now as, as maybe an initial lean or an opening thought? Well, let me tell you a game that I think is really fascinating as far as the, um, you know, just the spot. Navy and Tulsa. You know, what, what about Navy and Tulsa there? With Tulsa with the big, big lead there against SMU. Navy coming off the emotional game against Air Force, um, I think it's interesting to see the initial line move go toward Tulsa there. Um, I, I guess that's one that um, surprises me somewhat. I think people probably think the Tulsa front seven is good enough to slow down the the Navy um, triple option attack. But to me, that's a that's a fascinating game where you've got, uh, you know, a Navy team that is coming off a game that they clearly look forward to every single time. And then you've got a Tulsa team where, uh, you know, they're coming off a really tough loss. You know, if that, if that number gets big enough, though, I, I would probably lean toward Navy. That is a really, really interesting game. Good call there with that one. Last year, 37-29, Tulsa got beat, but the yards 404 to 370, although Navy's option did have 6.2 yards per carry in that game. So you wonder, you know, will Tulsa be able to make some adjustments here? Uh, good call on that spot, too. That's a, a really interesting one to say the least. Professional handicapper Kyle Hunter, who's working and find over at huntersportspicks.com. What's going on over there at the website right now, man? Yeah, I'm going to lower the prices here this week. Again, uh, 450 bucks for the rest of the season in college football, 350 bucks if you want only college football totals. Uh, if you have any questions or want any of those specials mentioned, bang the book uh, discount, you can message me, Kyle at huntersportspicks.com or at Kyle Hunter Picks on Twitter. Well, man, always a treat. Kyle Hunter, huntersportspicks.com. Really appreciate the time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, man. Take care.